The Women's Leadership Institute in the Auburn University College of Liberal Arts is pleased to present Leaders Educating Through Discussion. We hope you will take a moment after you watch our presentation to add your own voice to the dialogue on our website, auburn.edu slash women's leadership. Um, a lot of people ask me, how do you start this? And um, then people are fascinated by 501c3s in general, which is what the code is for a nonprofit. A lot of people are fascinated by nonprofits. They're fascinated by somebody who can take a non-paying volunteer work and turn it into a career. And then there's always the question of, well, where does the money come from? So I'm going to kind of clear up a little bit of that by telling you how I started Karma, how I got into this, what it is, and what's happened since it started. In um, 2008, I started competing in Miss, Miss Alabama preliminary pageants to win scholarships. And my community service platform was breast cancer awareness benefiting the Susan G. Komen Foundation. When you are a title holder, they like for you to come and speak to schools because you have a sparkly crown and kids like to see it. So I was asked to visit schools a lot during my reign, and you are also, as a title holder, expected to talk about your platform as much as possible and as many times as possible. Just mention it at least. Well, I found that I don't care who you are, how good of a speaker you are, how gifted you are with communication and woo, you cannot talk to fifth grade boys about breast cancer. It is not possible. <laughs> I tried one time and I got a whole classroom full of <laughs> <laughs> so I gave up so I was in these schools and I was with the sheriff's deputy here in Lee County who is a school resource officer teaching too good for drugs which is what Lee County has replaced the dare program with and in one of my classes the teacher asked me our word of the week is success how would you define success or could you give us a piece of advice to be successful I had never been asked that question before, and so I kind of said the first thing that came out of my mouth without thinking, which you guys will find I do a lot. Um, that's kind of how most of my speeches come out. But I said, be nice to everybody you meet. What goes around comes around, and you never know what kind of a battle somebody's fighting. They might need you right then. And so <clears throat> this little girl in the front row, who I remember looking at her when I walked in the room and thinking, gosh, she looks like I did when I was little. Her feet weren't quite touching the floor because she was too short, and she had really stringy hair and freckles and a gap between her teeth, and I was like, I think that that's me. <laughs> she raised her hand. She said, what if they're not nice to you? I said, well, you have to kill people with kindness. You have to be the nicest person in the room to make them look foolish for being mean to you. She said, well, if I was as pretty as you, people wouldn't make fun of me. And my heart just broke. I had suppressed everything that had ever happened to me. I realized that day that I had been bullied for 13 years, and the day I graduated, I put up a mental block and forgot about it. I ran. I ran away to college. I made a new life for myself, new friends, a whole new me, and I got away from it. And I realized right then that it was selfish of me to think that just because I left school, it didn't mean somebody else wasn't suffering, and I needed to do something about it. The other thing I realized that day was something huge about myself. When I was in school, I was bullied for being ugly. That was my classmate's thing. I was the ugly girl in my school. And that day, I realized that all I had ever wanted was for someone to call me pretty. That was the only thing I'd ever wanted in my life, was to be called pretty, because I was never the pretty girl. And right then, I realized that I never wanted to be called pretty again. Not if it meant that I had something that put somebody else under me, or if it meant that I was privileged in a way that she was going to hurt because I was the pretty girl. I cried, I was a mess, I came back in the classroom, I took her outside, I said, you know, I was ugly. And she said, nah. -uh. <laughs> I said, I, I still am. I said, I, I was made fun of every day. And she said, but you're like a model, you're Miss Alabama. I said, no, I'm Miss Auburn, <laughs> and I'm not Miss Alabama, I'm probably never going to be, but it's fun for now. And I said, but you know, one day, you know, you're going to do great things. And she said, well, you mean I could look like you one day? I said, one day you'll be better than me. You'll do everything that I'm doing now, but better. You'll be Miss Alabama. You'll be a model. And you'll get to go back to classrooms and tell everybody how great it really is. And she said, do you think I could do that? And I said, of course you can. So I didn't think anything of that conversation. And the next week, her teacher emailed me to tell me, her grades had made a complete 180 turnaround. She was now making friends in class. She was crying less. And at home, her parents had emailed the teacher to say, what have you done with my child because she was so different at home? Her parents had thought she was naturally shy and, in, and an introvert. And on that day, she suddenly started going home with all this spunk and enthusiasm and playing and talking and chatting and wanting to go make new friends. And it was all because I told her it would be OK. So I called my mom when I left the school, and I was crying, and I said, 
I think I figured out why I had to suffer for so long. Because the whole time I was in school, I would ask my mom, why is this happening to me? I'm smart. I make good grades. I study. I do what I'm supposed to do. I follow the rules, and I'm nice to everybody. Why is this happening to me? There are so many people who this should be happening to to teach them empathy. And wh I already have that. Why is this happening? My mom said, you may not know for a very long time why this is happening, but I promise it's for a reason. So I called her. I said, I figured it out. I have to go back and tell them it's going to be okay. And she said, okay. How are you going to do that? And I said, well, I'm already in pageants. This gives me a reason, an excuse, if you will, to go out and do community service. This will be my platform. As soon as I finish Miss Alabama next month, I'm switching to bullying. She said, okay. So I did what everybody in our generation does. I went home and I Googled bullying. I was going to support a national organization against bullying. I was going to do the pageant girl thing, fundraise and take pictures and pass out information cards, you know, <coughs> the usual community service. Well, I Googled it, and there was no national organization working to end bullying. There was not a single organization out there that focused on bullying, and the only organizations that mentioned it had like a section on their website with some coloring book pages. I went back to my mom. I said, never mind, I'm not going to do this anymore. And she said, why? I said, because there's not a national organization against bullying. She said, so make one. And I looked at her and I thought, you're crazier than I originally thought you were. Because we all think our mothers are crazy. You're supposed to. So I remember looking at her and thinking, you know, all these years I thought there was something wrong with you, and now I'm positive. And she said, no, really, just do it. And I said, okay, well, I wanted to do, again, the pageant girl thing. So I made a really cute acronym. I wanted to name it Karma, you know, what goes around comes around, and that's kids against, and I was like, well, there's no B, so I can't put bullying, and my mom and I tossed around ideas for a few hours, and kids against ridicule, meanness, and aggression was born. I wrote an essay that night to turn in for my next pageant, and I had this beautiful essay. I spent so much time on it, and I printed it out, and I was like, I'm going to end bullying. <laughs> now what? <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> Do I go to that school I was just at the other day and grab the kids and tell them to be nice? Do I let them read my essay? Do I write to the papers? Do I, what do I do? I had no idea what I was doing, and I am very politically geared. I've always been pre-law, as I told you guys, ever since I was five years old and decided I was going to be a Supreme Court justice. I've been into politics and law. And so I did what was in my nature to do. I said, I got it. There's a need. I'm going to fill it. Alabama doesn't have any bullying laws. Great. I can get some bullying laws passed. I got my new crown that summer. I won my preliminary, and um, I was Miss Fountain City, which is out of Prattville. We went to the back-to-school street dance, and their local representative was there, Representative Matt Gibson. I walked up to him, and I shook his hand, and I said, I'm Jessica Brookshire, and we need some bullying laws in here in Alabama to protect our children. He patted me on the head, and he goes, <laughs> you're so cute. Are you our new Miss Fountain City? I'm not cute. I'm trying to get some laws passed here, buddy. And he said, well, you know, you, you don't really understand how Alabama politics works. And I said, we'll see. I promise you I'll get those laws passed. I worked with him a little bit throughout the year, but that statement rang true until today. You don't understand how Alabama politics works. It's extremely difficult to get a law passed in Alabama politics that doesn't pertain to adults. If it doesn't relate to adults in some way, it is extremely difficult to get passed. So I worked throughout the year. I went and met with Governor Riley. I was like, I've got time in front of this man. I'm going to tell Governor Riley exactly what I think about the fact that Alabama doesn't have bullying laws. I went in there, and he said, he leaned down, because if you guys don't know, I'm wearing big girl shoes right now. I'm about five feet tall. He leaned down. He said, oh, are you not just the cutest thing I have ever seen? Did you want a picture? Come over here. Excuse me. I I'm here to talk politics, sir. <laughs> And he didn't take me seriously, and nobody did. And that's what I kept getting was pats on the head and pats on the back. And um, my mom said somewhere in all of this, Jessica, you can't wait around on them to do something. She said, if everybody in this nation waited on our legislators to do something for us, I don't know where we, we would be. We wouldn't be anywhere. She said, you've got to do something. This isn't an activist project for you to sit back and wait on them to do something. So my great aunt, thankfully, was a retired teacher in Birmingham Inner City Schools. You cannot go, somebody asked me today, how do you get in the schools? You can't just go to a school and say, hey, I want to talk to your kids. They are not going to let you in, first of all, and they're not going to spend any money to bring you in either if they don't know you and they don't know what you're going to say and they don't know that you're good at what you do. Well, it's one of those catch-22s where you can't do it till you have experience, but you can't get the experience till you do it, but nobody's going to give you the chance to do it to get the experience, and you chase your tail for a little while until you find an in. My great-aunt called her principal 
she said my niece is doing this thing and you know I I love it if you would just let her in I walked into that gym that day I had no idea what I was doing I was told I was going to school for an anti-bullying day it was Center Street Middle School in Birmingham sixth through eighth grade the kids had decorated the entire gym with posters. They had colored pictures of me, crowns, Miss Jessica's coming, anti-bullying days, Center Street Middle School supports karma. They did skits for me. They had written poems they read. One boy sang me a rap song about bullying. And I am sitting in my chair and just enjoying the fanfare, and I'm so excited, and I feel so honored that other people saw what I saw and the importance of the issue, even if they were 11 and 12 years old. They saw it. And so I'm just sitting there so excited, and then the next child goes off from reading their poem, and the principal said, okay, it's your turn, and handed me the microphone. And I was like, for what? <laughs> she said, to talk. And I was like, about what? She said, your platform, bullying, your story. I took that microphone. I had no clue what I was going to say. I had no clue how to talk about bullying, and I had never told anybody my entire story because I kept my bullying to myself. I didn't think anyone else would understand. I didn't think that anybody else had ever been bullied in their entire lives. I felt 100% alone, and so I never told. And I took that microphone that day, and I started to talk, and I told those kids beginning to end everything that happened to me. And at the end, I told them, I'm standing here with a crown on my head. I was the ugly girl, and then I won a beauty pageant. It doesn't matter what they say about you. What matters is what you truly think of what they say about you. Do you believe it? Do you let them say it? Do you let it define you? What do you believe? After the assembly, I had kids lined up, crying, hugging me. Oh my gosh, this is so wonderful. The next week, it was breaking news in Birmingham that um, that particular school suspended 21 girls for a bullying incident. 21 girls in one day. And the news obviously jumped on it. And the first thing on the news is a sixth grade little girl going, well, I don't know why they did it. Miss Brookshire came up here and told us not to. And I thought, they listened. Somebody listened. Well, word of mouth got out, and I got a phone call the next week from a cousin of one of the counselors at that school who wanted me to come to her school. And then I got another phone call from a church of one of the women at that school who wanted me to speak at their church. And then somebody saw my news story and wanted to have me here. And next thing I knew, I went to Miss Alabama that June, and in six short months, I had spoken to 88,000 students face to face. I was overwhelmed. At Miss Alabama, we have a community service project where we turn in scrapbooks detailing your year of service and you compete for a scholarship. In Alabama, community service is like the biggest deal out of all the pageant fanfare. It's community service. We're a very community service oriented franchise of the Miss America system. And winning community service to some is bigger than winning the crown. These girls start developing their platforms when they're 10 and 11 years old. And by the time they turn the scrapbook in, you've got a project that's at least seven years old. My baby was six months old. I made top seven. And I thought, okay, they must have thought my scrapbook was really pretty. I put a lot of time into it. Now I'm going to go in this interview and tell them about why the scrapbook's pretty. I went into my interview, and I rambled. I didn't answer the questions that were asked of me. I said whatever was on my mind again. I went over time and I still answered questions as I was walking out the door and I was so nervous that when I left I was like thank you so much. You have no idea how much that means to me and I walked out. Next to all of the other six girls who are perfectly polished with all of their facts and statistics ready I called my mom. I said I blew it. It's the worst interview of my life. It's the first time I've ever bombed an interview. I won. I died. I had no clue what to do. I was shaking. I was crying. You would have thought I had won Miss Alabama right there on the stage at the luncheon because I won community service, and I had beat out girls who had been working for seven, eight, nine, ten years on their projects. And it was because it meant something to me. It was because there was a lot more passion than just work. The next year, I became the only contestant in the history of Miss Alabama to win community service two years in a row. I also became the only contestant in the history of Miss Alabama to win the State Community Service Award at the same time that I won the National Miss America Award. And to me, it wasn't about the scholarships. It was a very healthy scholarship, but it was about people see what I'm doing. They recognize that I'm doing something. I'm reaching people. In the schools I go to, kids come up to me afterwards. They want personal counseling. Out of a school of maybe 1,100 students, I'll get anywhere between 30 and 80 students that will stay after, and they stand in a straight line, and they come to me and tell me things that they will not tell their own parents. They will tell me things they won't even tell their best friends. I have kids that tell me all about their bullying. I've had kids pull up their sleeves to show me bloody wrist where they had cut themselves that morning. 
from the bullying and had never told anybody, but they felt like I would understand. I've had girls come to me and disclose that they had been raped. I've had children disclose to me their home problems, be it molestation, alcoholic parents, drug use in the home, abuse, things of that nature. And these are not things I talk about. These are not things I bring to light in my speech. But it's because uh, each child in that room feels like they have a connection with me when they leave. It's a gift. I have no idea what I do. I don't know how I do it. Somehow, when I take a microphone in a school gymnasium, I am able to talk to every single child in that room individually. I also have the power to keep 6th through 12th graders still listening, quiet, and engaged for an hour and 15 minutes. I don't even think teachers can do that. <laughs> But it's because I talk about things that are relevant. I put myself on their level. I talk about the things they're going through. And because I don't work for the schools and I can, I get to leave at the end of the day. I talk about the tough stuff that nobody wants to talk about. When I started Karma, my initial mission statement was to teach kids to be nice. I was going to go out in the world and reteach people how to be nice because we've all forgotten. And as I got into the schools, I started to see the uglier side of bullying. Bullying is more than pushing and shoving. It's more than just name calling. These kids are making fun of children with Down syndrome. These kids are laughing at kids who have physical deformities. They are pushing other children in wheelchairs into the walls and hallways. These kids are encouraging girls to harm themselves, commit suicide, oh, just go kill yourself because they're not pretty enough to be around them at school. Our kids are absolutely ruthless. And I didn't want to deal with that side of bullying because it hurt me too bad. Then. I found the suicide part of bullying. Megan Meyer was the first recorded suicide due to bullying, and it was the first case of cyberbullying we heard of. It was in 2006. It was the first major news story about bullying. That was when bullying kind of started to take off. It didn't become a buzzword until last year. You might say I've been working on bullying before it was cool. But when I started, Megan Meyer's story had inspired me because I saw it, and I saw that she had taken her own life, and the first thing I thought when I looked at that picture and I heard what happened was that could have been me. And I sat in my room here in Auburn wondering, why did I make it out alive? What made it okay for me? Because my bullying was the same as hers. And I remember thinking about suicide. I remember thinking I was supposed to die. And if my classmates didn't want me to die, they wouldn't have treated me that way. I remember thinking that. Why her and not me? So I emailed her mom when I started Karma. Well, I sent a message to the foundation website. So I expected to get back like an, an automatic response or maybe a secretary or somebody like that. I told her my whole story. And I said, when I met your daughter that day on my, on my TV screen on the news, your daughter is me. I'm your daughter. Like, I, I don't know how I could have prevented this. I can't. But for some reason, I feel an obligation to tell you that I promise I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure it never happens again. She emailed me back and said, I've never been to Alabama do you want to do a two-day media tour? And she came, and for two days we visited schools. We went to the Capitol. We were on every news station between Montgomery and Birmingham. Those news stations passed our bits off to the stations in Mobile and Huntsville, and I was statewide within the first two months of Karma, all because this woman believed in me and believed in my story and came to help me. Tina Meyer ended up being one of my greatest mentors. She taught me a lot of what I know about bullying facts. She taught me a lot about how to deliver them to students and about speaking techniques for assembly. She also taught me a little bit about the structure of an organization like this. What I do is not a normal nonprofit. And so for the last year, um, what I wanted to do, like I said, was go to law school. Last summer I was accepted to law school and I turned it down. What happened was I got my um, acceptance letter in the mail. For those of you who know about law school, it is a commitment. There is no sleep. You are in class for 12 hours a day, and when you're not in class, you're studying for the other 12 hours a day. That's how your time is broken down. That's it. You can't do other things when you're in law school unless you have very intense time management skills. So I knew that when I finished with karma would be the day I went to law school. And I knew that when I went to law school, karma was finished. There was no way it could run without me going to schools every day. So last summer, I got my acceptance letter, and I said, okay, this is it. I'm shutting karma down. I'm going to law school. It's time. I've helped other people for two and a half years, and now it's time for me to do me. I'm going to law school. Well, the next letter that I opened was from one of my schools. Um, the kids will write me thank you notes and letters and stuff, and they send them to me. And so it was my very last school I had gone to at the end of the school year, and it was my last batch of letters. The very first letter I pulled out, right after I said I'm not going to do karma anymore, I'm going to law school, the first letter I pulled out said, Dear Lady, 
thank you so much. I know, kids. I've been called Lady, Miss Ma'am, Hey Ma'am, Miss Alabama, Miss Lady. Um, <laughs> so I get this letter and it says, Dear Lady, thank you so much for coming to my school. I was bullied too. Let me tell you what they did to me. And she tells me all her stories about kids throwing balls at her in PE and calling her names and making fun of her for not being as fast as everyone else. And then she says, I got so upset the other day that I went home and I took soup cans and I was cutting my arms and it felt so much better because at least then it was real pain and it wasn't the kind of pain that you can't make better. She said, last night I wrote my suicide note to my mom and I left it on my bed and I was gonna take my life after school today because I didn't think that anybody wanted me alive. She said, I didn't know that there would be an angel at my school today to tell me that everything would be okay. And now I just am going to go home and I'm going to tear that letter up and hug my mom. Thank you for saving my life. And it said, love the girl in the second row in a purple dress. I will never know who that child was. I have no way of finding that child even if I wanted to. But in that moment, I was like, okay, there are certain things you want to do in life and there are certain things you have to do. And so I made the hardest phone call I've ever made and I called the University of Alabama and I told them, thank you so much for the spot, but I can't. They didn't understand and I didn't expect them to and it was the hardest decision I've ever made and I cried for a week and then right about the time I finished crying, my packet, my new student packet came in the mail with all my law school readings and my Alabama law t-shirt and I was like, oh, I don't know if this is right. But I went forward with my decision. At the end of the summer, I had nothing. I had no bookings for the fall, no schools were calling, none of them were responding to my emails and I thought this was a bad decision. I was right, karma's over and it's over and done with and nobody wants to hear me and I made a horrible decision and now I'm stuck for a year. The day after I said that, I got four phone calls in one day and I was booked up for the next week. And then from that week, word of mouth got out and I was booked for the next three weeks. By the middle of September, I was booked solid through Christmas. I got Christmas off, I did a conference, I came back in the spring, I had all of January booked before I even started spring semester. By the end of February, I was booked solid through the end of May. And if Dr. Baker hadn't called when she did, I wouldn't have been here this week because there were plenty of people that were upset I was here and not in their schools. And so since August, I've visited three to five schools a day, five days a week. I've been in six states. I've been on CNN four times. I've been on the Mike Huckabee show once. I have visited schools in areas that most people have not heard of. I've been to cities in Alabama that I'm sure even you Alabama natives don't know where they are because I didn't either and I couldn't find them on a map. I have stayed in hotels that I don't ever want to go back to and I have been to towns where there are no restaurants and when I asked the people at the school, I said, so like, where do y'all go out to eat? And he goes, grandma's house? <laughs> right, so where am I gonna eat? <laughs> I'm in a hotel. So I have traveled, I have gotten homesick. Um, in October was when it really hit me, when it started to get cold outside. And that first cold day when all you wanna do is go home and put on a sweatshirt and sit and watch movies, I was in a hotel room. And it hurt. And I hadn't been home in three weeks and I was like, this is so hard. And then the next day I got that rejuvenation again with another kid who came to me and told me something that just changed everything for me and them. And so every time I think I can't do it anymore and I think I don't have any energy left, something happens to just pull me back up. Well, we wanted to get our nonprofit status for a while. If you guys are wondering how I run this and who works for me and who's my amazing staff, it's me and my mom. And my mother goes with me to all of my schools. She drives me everywhere. She makes the phone calls and holds the schedule. We do take a speaking fee. It, it is just enough for us to break even on gas and business expenses. I do not take a salary. I have never made money off of karma. I've done this for three years with no pay. And having a master's degree and an undergraduate degree and no pay is one of the hardest ego things to deal with in the world. But I have to. So my mom and I have been traveling and we haven't been able to apply for our nonprofit status because we just don't have the time because we work all day and all night because when schools are done, well, churches want us to come talk and then so-and-so wants us to talk at their dinner and there's just not a break. My dad jumped on board. He said, I'll help you. What do you want me to do? We found this company in Nashville called the Foundation Group. What they do is they file for nonprofits. They put your paperwork together. They coach you through the process. They answer the questions for the IRS and they file your taxes for you for the first two years. We were like, this is great. How much is it? We'll pay you everything. Just do that. <laughs> 
Well, we paid, we started to file in January and something came up and something else came up and my dad's business got in the way and then more schools and finally three weeks ago my dad got the chance to answer all of their questions and start the filing process and I got notified last week that Karma will be an official 501c3 nonprofit within the next 30 to 45 days. So for me, that's the biggest accomplishment yet, but it has brought with it a huge change for Karma. Up to this point, it's been me in the driver's seat. I'm the one that speaks. I'm the one that controls what's said. I'm the one that controls who thinks what about karma, what my mission statement is, how I proceed, the things I do and don't do, the people I will and won't allow in. This has all been me. In a nonprofit, it's very sticky legally. And so the board that Dr. Hale was talking about earlier, the board gets to make all of the decisions. And the board members, you cannot have a family member of any board member that is paid by the nonprofit. Well, in order to keep karma what it is for right now to get off the ground and running, my dad is my senior board member because it's somebody I trust. It's somebody I know I can guard. He will guard karma. He will guard the best interest of what I've built, and he won't let it go away. But I can't speak for karma anymore. I've had to let go, and that was the hardest thing to do is to build something up that means so much to you and to spend so much time on it and then to hand it over to people and trust them to do something good with it and have a complete hands-off approach. But that's what I'm having to do. Karma has also taken another huge leap this year. I am very excited. In January, I went to a conference in Tampa called Live Your Legacy Summit. Um, I was the keynote speaker. And after I spoke, I, we were talking about living your legacy and how you know you don't have to die to have a legacy. You can be living it right now. And so I was talking about what I do. And I said, you know, you don't have to get paid to live your legacy either. And everybody laughed. And I said, I mean, I logged 80 hours last week, this past week before I got here today. And so I said, you don't have to get paid to live your legacy. You can work yourself to death and <laughs> still live your legacy. And everybody laughed. And afterwards, this woman comes up to me and she goes, I want to talk to you. And I'm like, OK. She goes, you're really stupid. <laughs> I was like, it's really nice to meet you. What was your name again? She said, you don't get paid for what you do. Do you have any idea how much it's worth, like the amount of speaking you can do and what you do and the way you connect with people? Do you know what that's worth? And I was like, apparently $250 to a school. She goes, no, there are people who are really bad at what you do. They get paid like thousands of dollars for 30 minutes. She goes, why are you not getting paid? I said, well, because I just feel bad asking for it. And she goes, right, you're going to be working 90 hours a week for nothing for the rest of your life if you feel bad asking for it. <laughs> she said, let me help you. This is what I do. I own a production management company, and what we do is we pr produce infomercials. She said, we produce the infomercials that you see at 3 in the morning for all of the, like, fat burners, diet supplements, make me beautiful, take this pill, and you'll be 20 forever. That's what she does. She said, I've never really done the bullying thing. I've really never done anything charitable with my organization. She said, but I'm just really thinking like from my realm and what I do combined with what you do, I think there's something big here. And I'm thinking, okay. So we kept in touch. Next thing I know, I'm signing a contract. She's now my manager. And she kind of tells me we're going to do this, this, and this. We're going to keep you on the bullying thing. She said, but what I'm noticing with you and with the feedback I'm getting off of the internet and people who have met you and watching your clips, and she said, Jessica, bullying's not your only thing. She said, when you leave a room, if you were only doing bullying, then you would only be affecting kids, 5 through 17. That's your age range. She said, but you spoke to a United Methodist men's group of men aged 65 to 94, and every one of them had tears in their eyes. They came up. They were hugging you. They were laughing. They're all wanting to get involved. She said, you speak to women, and they want to get involved. You talk to people who don't have kids, and they're into it. She said, it's not because you're convincing it's because you are a good person, and it shows when you talk. She said, you come and talk to a bunch of mothers, and they're not thinking, gosh, I hope this girl can help my daughter with their bullying. They're thinking, gosh, how do I make my daughter this girl? And I'm thinking, nobody wants to be with me. And Charlie said, no, but they do. She said, I think you can help people learn how to transform themselves. She said, you didn't go from being ugly to being in beauty pageants on accident. You did it because you believed in yourself. You did it because you decided one day that what the other people said about you wasn't you. It was what you said about you. She said, and you have a gift for that, so pass it to other people. Help other people change their lives. So we started this self-transformation self kind of side of me as a speaker. Part of my problem has been that there's one of me, and there are millions of them, meaning kids. 
There are way too many of them for me to reach all of them. And there's only so much I can drive in one day. And there's only so many days that I can go without sleep or food before it just all falls apart. So we were trying to find out a way to duplicate me without losing my touch. We filmed my DVDs last week. We're developing a curriculum this summer that will be for sale in a DVD workbook package for all age groups. There's one per age group starting in August. We are also starting in August instead of me visiting individual schools. I'm finally learning the beauty of working smarter, not harder. I've been working hard for three years, and I'm, I'm almost worn out. i got to work smart now. We're working on field trips. I'm working on renting, say, the Civic Center in the central area and letting all of the uh, four counties, five counties in the surrounding area know and let the kids pay $10, $15 a head to come on a field trip and hear me. And then I get the opportunity to speak to 55 schools at once instead of doing my speech 55 times. So we're working on expanding karma. I'm training another speaker as we speak. And my biggest just accomplishment to me or the biggest uh, maybe feather in my cap, trophy, award, whatever you want to call it, is as you've noticed when other people recognize what I'm doing and when they believe in it. I had a fraternity here at Auburn, Sigma Phi Epsilon, adopt karma as their official new philanthropy. I have a group of 10 college-age men. They go to three of the poorest schools in Columbus, Georgia. They go once a week, and they were going to go out there and teach the kids about bullying. That's what they were going to do. So they went out to teach the kids about bullying the first day. And if you haven't talked to me yet, you don't know. But the K through 2, I don't teach them about bullying because they don't understand it. We talk about the bully monster. And he lives in your school and he eats mean words. And if you feed him, he stays. And if you don't feed him, he goes away. And if you can do certain things, you can chase him away by making new friends. So I teach him about the bully monster. So this fraternity has gone in to teach about the bully monster. They told the kids that they're on my bully monster team. And they spend about two hours a week with these kids, K through five. Well, the first day when they left, they mentioned to one of the teachers, they said, so-and-so looks really tired. Is he okay? And she said, well, he doesn't eat when he leaves school. It, when he leaves on Friday, his school lunch is the last thing he eats until he gets back on Monday. His family doesn't have any food in their house. And the only food they can get has to go to the younger kids because they need it more than he does. And one of the boys called me and he said, I can't believe I live in Auburn where everybody is so privileged and everything is so okay. And 40 minutes down the road, there are kids starving. So they rearranged their philanthropy and now they're doing a food drive specifically for that school. They went back and they saw a little boy who was wearing pants that were way too big for him and he was holding his little pants everywhere he walked. My brother is in this fraternity. My brother called me. He said, these kids wear clothes that don't fit. I said, call the counselor and ask. They have a donation closet. And the only way the kids can afford their school uniforms is if they grow out of their clothes, they put them in the closet, and they're allowed to take someone else's. So the entire school is wearing each other's hand-me-downs. So now they've started an initiative where they're calling other schools in more privileged areas of Alabama, and at the end of the school year, when nobody claims the lost and found, all of these schools are donating their lost and found items to the Karma Foundation for us to redistribute in the lower-income schools in Columbus through this fraternity. They're mentoring them on good decisions. They're mentoring them on conflict resolution, reducing the aggression in schools. One of the biggest problems I face is fighting. Kids are fighting more and more. Their fights are getting more violent. There was a little girl in California about a month and a half ago who died as a result of a head injury from a fight with a girl after school. They are really hurting each other. And it's boys and girls. When I was in school, it was boys that fought. Well, now girls fight more than boys. And so we've got these college-age people, young men and women, adults, if you will, who are going into schools and showing them, you know, I'm in college, and kids want to be you when you're in college. That's what they want to be. College kids are the coolest kids on the face of the planet when you're in school, and you just look at them, and you're like, I want to be that. So when these boys go in and tell them, I'm in college, and I don't believe in fighting. I don't think it's good. It's like a magic pill. It goes away. And so karma is spreading. I've got two other universities here in Alabama that are um, – franchising my karma operative in their own respective areas. I have karma clubs in about 50 schools so far where they take my lesson plans and my curriculum that I've developed and carry the message through the rest of the year. It gives students a hands-on approach to keep doing what I do, and it takes it off of the adults. I've learned from the beginning of this that if you want something done, you don't really have to do it yourself. You have to put it in the hands of people who want to do it. You have to put it in the hands of people who care as much about the issue as you do. At the beginning, I tried talking to politicians. Well, forgive me for saying this, but these old men don't care what's going on in schools. And to them, bullying is not that big of a deal. Well, when I was in school, we got in a tussle on the playground. It was no big deal. Well, it is a big deal now. 
We've had two suicides in the state of Alabama in the last six months. I've spoken at the candlelight vigils for these kids. It is a big problem. And at the beginning when that man said, oh, you're cute, but you don't know how Alabama politics works. My mom said the other day, we were looking back on that, she said, Jessica, you could have spent three years lobbying for laws and praying that they would help someone. Or you could have spent three years visiting 185,000 kids and touching every single one of them and saving who knows how many lives through those 185,000 kids. She said, there don't have to be laws to be make a difference. Laws aren't always going to solve everything. Our anti-bullying law has died again this year in um, session. It died last year. It's died this year. Lobbyists are blocking my law because they don't believe that it's fair for me to put a burden on teachers to have to protect kids in the classroom. They have too many other things to worry about. I know. Some of you are looking at me like, what? Yes, that's exactly what they said. Um, I also have a lobbyist who is blocking it because of the gay, lesbian, transgendered, and bisexual um, epidemic. There's a huge, I guess, side of bullying that only deals with gay, lesbian, transgendered, and bisexual. It's not necessarily that it's those kids that are being targeted on this side. It's that, but it's also a combination of the fact that kids don't understand the power of the words they're using, and it's totally okay to call each other these horrible slurs, and they put the pressure on the other kids that, oh, well, you know, you're gay. That's the worst thing they say, but you've got a 12 or 13-year-old boy who's already insecure and is developing and not quite sure about anything and doesn't really like himself at all and then has everybody at the school calling him that and we actually had a kid in the United Kingdom who committed suicide from being called gay because he wasn't and nobody would understand and then there's also the kids who are maybe they are and they're teased for that and so the bullying surrounding the gay lesbian transgender bisexual is a monster all of its own in Alabama the law that I, we wrote actually encompasses that it covers everyone it doesn't matter what you're being bullied for if you're be bullied for being short or poor or fat or rich or ugly or pretty or tall or short freckles it doesn't matter why you're being bullied this law covers that it gives you protection and it also offers punishment for the victim it or for the bully it offers a three strike rule first strike letter home second strike mandatory conference third strike no questions asked the child the bully is removed from the school expelled and sent to an alternative school so the three strike rule was a good deterrent method but because it will not specifically enumerate in the law because there's not room gay lesbian transgender and bisexual because it's just broad the lobbyists won't let it out of um, committee so no my law won't be passed again this year but to be truthful there's 45 states in America that have these laws and bullying hadn't stopped there either so I don't think that maybe in my case laws are necessarily the answer maybe I was looking at the wrong thing maybe laws can help a lot of things but they can't govern behavior you can't change behavior with a law you can't instill compassion and kindness into our kids with a law you do it with a hands-on interaction you do it face to face by showing them that they mean something, showing them they're important, empowering them and giving them something to do, showing them that they do make a difference. And so it's that hands-on interaction. So now the next step with karma, people have asked me, I don't really know. It's growing, it's getting huge. And it's a combination of training adults to go out into the world and touch a kid's life. And me still trying to reach out directly to kids connecting older people with children mentoring and earlier I told you guys what I was into I'm into a little bit of everything well the reason I'm into a little bit of everything and I feel passionate about so many issues is because just about every issue or problem that you see or hear about in a school stems directly from bullying you want to whine about low test scores well your kids can't concentrate when they're being bullied we have a high dropout rate seven out of kids that drop out of high school do it because they're being bullied suicide rates and kids under the age of 18 are at an all-time high Bullying's the number one cause. Bullying and peer pressure have led to increased levels of alcohol and substance abuse among teens. Girls are having sex at earlier ages because they are being bullied into it. They think, if I have sex, I won't be bullied anymore because they're making fun of me because I won't. And then they do, and they get teased even more. It's causing so many health issues that it's starting to stem to the generation after that. One of the schools I went to, a uh, sophomore in high school, had had a baby. She was bullied while she was pregnant so bad that when her baby was born, it was born with in utero stress and could not breathe or eat for the first two months of her life because of the stress she went through from the bullying had affected her new daughter. And so the physical effects of this are real. Only, the only reason I say that is because so many people don't understand or care that the emotional effects are real. So many of us have to see it for ourselves. There's your proof. 
Bullying leads to absolutely every single problem that you see in school-age kids. I spoke at an alternative school for girls. It was a youth attention center, not detention. It's their last stop before a detention center. It's a nine-month program where the girls go to be re rehabilitated for ungovernable behavior, truancy, fighting, or runaways. They get sent to the school to learn how to behave in schools before they get sent to a detention center. I went and spoke to them. After I spoke, every single one of those girls came up to me and said, I've been in here angry and blaming everyone else for why I'm here. I'm why I'm here. I'm the one who did this, and I'm the only one that's going to change it. And every one of them also told me that they were there because of bullying. About half of them were there because they were bullies. They had gotten in trouble for fighting and being aggressive at school. And the other half were there because they had been bullied and quit going to school. They had been bullied and they fought back. They had been bullied and they were so devastated that the emotional effects had caused them to verbally lash out at teachers or other faculty. The bullying was causing these girls to do things that is getting them removed from schools. So then as adults in an administrative position, we have to look at this as, wait a minute, you mean to tell me that the child that's hurting is the one we're kicking out of school? Yeah, because we're not handling it properly. So for me, karma is about legislation, education, and awareness. Education and awareness being the two biggest things, letting adults know that bullying is not just kids being kids. It's not a game anymore, and it's not people stealing lunch money on the playground. Bullying is a very real issue. It is probably the biggest, most dangerous issue facing our kids now. Um, every school shooting in the United States has been traced to a victim of bullying as the shooter. In the last year, I have deterred three school shootings with my presentation because at the end, I tell the kids, I encourage them to tell, I give them a call to action if they see or hear something. I went to Weetumpka Middle School, north of Montgomery, about three weeks ago. The day after I left, breaking news, Weetumpka Middle's locked down. Two sixth grade girls went to an administrator and said, Miss Jessica said we should tell you if we hear something, right? And the administrator said yes. They said, this seventh grader was talking about this, this, and this about a gun, and he said this, and we don't know what he was talking about, but he was definitely talking about a gun. They locked down the school, found the seventh grader, and he did have a loaded handgun in his backpack that he was prepared to use that day. So because the those two girls felt empowered and they felt like they could make a difference and they felt like an adult would listen to them and they felt like they did have control over the issue and they did have a power in the situation, they went and told, and that school is now safe. We deterred a graduation plan shooting in a very small town in Alabama, a town that is so small, in fact, that I'm pretty sure they could all fit in here. And it's very small, 900 population for the whole town. And one of the boys had planned a shooting for graduation. And after I left, some of the girls who had heard it went and told, and it was deterred. And now he's in an alternative school who being rehabilitated for anger management. So. What I'm doing is reaching a little bit farther than just making people feel good, even though that's what I like to do, and even though that's my goal, and that's my, my drive is my woo. <laughs> but it reaches, bi it's bigger than that. And so I, I don't know how big it's going to get. I don't know how it's gotten to this point. When I look back on the last three years, and I look at 180,000 kids and Huckabee and CNN and everything else, it's like I don't feel like I put in the work you would think you need to put in to get to this point. I know I have, but I don't feel like it. I don't feel like I deserve everything that karma is right now. But it's because this is what I'm supposed to be doing. What Carrie told me something earlier that really like rang with me and it stayed with me is you got a purpose. It's, it's different than your plan. There's your purpose and there's your plan. And if you're doing your purpose, well, doors don't close. Things kind of fall into your lap and everything just falls into place. And so how can you guys take anything away from all of this as leaders, as women? Be that. Be a female leader. It's okay to be both. And it's okay to lead people. And you don't have to lead people like everyone else does. You don't have to stand up at the front of a room and command people where to sit to be a leader. You don't have to own a business to be a leader. That's not what it means. Being a leader means reaching inside of yourself, finding what it is that makes you special, what it is that touches the people around you, and giving that to everyone around you. That's how you lead. You lead just by being you. That's all it takes. And I have a lot of people who ask me, well, you're so lucky, you know. You found your purpose at 21 years old. How am I going to find my purpose? Some people die not knowing why they're here. How am I going to know? I mean, you're, you're 25 and you're living your purpose. So are you. You just don't know it. So if you're sitting here wondering, well, I'm not doing anything great. What's my purpose? You don't have to do great things to have a purpose. Pur a purpose. If you've touched one person's life, if you have made one person feel good or made one person's day turn around, then you're living your purpose. You're being a leader. 
So leading is about purpose. Being a leader is about example, and it's not about being anything but you and showing other people how great you really are. So if you think you don't have it, just figure out what it is you already do that you're good at and do more of it. It's that simple. So thank you.